Thank you. Okay, it is uh, Friday, January 14th. This is Senate Government Operations, and um, we are looking at pensions today. And we have, I, I can't believe that you're all here. And Andrew is coming in at 2.30. He's going to take a little break at 2.30. So what I'm going to do is um, first have the committee introduce themselves, because you may not know all of us. You probably know me. I'm Jeanette. White from Wyndham County. Hi, all. I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Brian Collimore representing the Rutland County District. Uh, Allison Clarkson representing uh, the Windsor District. And it is really great to see you. And nice. I met Kate very briefly. It's lovely to see you all. And thank you for your um, uh, uh, hard work. We're really all so grateful. And we will hopefully be um, joined by. Um, Senator Keisha Rom Hinsdale from Chittenden County. And what I'm gonna do right now is um, let the, first of all, is anybody under a real time constraint here and needs to um, speak and get out of here right away? I, oh, Dan? Dan, do you? Uh, yeah, I'm at a uh, I'm at a jury trial, and uh, I, they're going to be uh, I think sending the case to the jury really soon. So I'm on okay. lunch break. So, so what I'm going to do then is start with Dan and have you introduce yourself, what your role was on the task force, and just some observations and um, whatever you want to say about where we landed, and um, we have gone through a lot of it. We're going to have Chris walk us through even more details today. And Jane Kitchell will be joining us again today to walk through the state obligations. So Dan, if you would like to start, introduce yourself and, oh, and there's Senator Rom Hinsdale. Thank you. Okay, Dan, if you'd like to start. Sure. Uh, I'm Dan Trottier. I'm with the uh, Troopers Association. Uh, so I was uh, represented for the VTA and the, the Group C membership of the uh, of the VSERS uh, pension plan. So uh, that was good. Number one, I want to uh, take a second to, at least on behalf of the VTA membership, because I'm sure a lot of them, um, you know, they, they pay attention, but they're not quite sure how the how the whole process played out to where we are. So it, I think it's important to a uh, thank this committee because I know this committee had an extremely a uh, big role in uh, getting us to where we were to actually be able to come back, uh, sit at the table uh, as a group and, and come up with a uh, with an agreement that I think works for all of us. So I, I want to at least take a moment on on the behalf of our members uh, to thank this committee for for that and uh, getting us to that place uh, as we're going. So thanks. Um, in, in general, um, you know, I, I think the 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 process went the way I guess I, I anticipated it would go. Uh, it took us a little while, I think, to just kind of get get comfortable with each other and 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 understanding what uh, the perspectives and and where we were coming from uh, at the end. But I, I think at the end of the day, uh, we 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 stuck to what we agreed to, which is we were going to come uh, work collaboratively to make a deal that uh, works for both sides, and and I think that both sides are comfortable with and, and can work with, and I definitely think we reached that. Uh, and uh, as far as I have heard, um, you know, again, uh, there's never there's never 100 percent of anything. Um, but so far, what, what I have heard from from the folks in our in our um, in our group and, and just from people around is uh, I think there's a sigh of relief. I, I think the the pensioners are uh, grateful that we were able to come to an agreement that um, works for both sides, and I have yet to hear anyone uh, have any uh, misgivings about this agreement or uh, anything like that. So I, I think we're in a good place, and uh, it is certainly because of, of the hard work of, from everybody on the task force together. So, Thank you, Dan. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, instead of each time one of you speaks, say how grateful we are for your participation, say it now to all of you. We, this could not have happened without the hard work of the six of you who represented the, the um, pension, the beneficiaries and the active members. So I, I have um, 
those of you who didn't serve on the task force, it, it, was, it was really, really hard work. And the, these six people were crucial to that hard work and worked really hard to get us where we are. And, and most importantly, I believe, um, we work together respectfully. Um, so the, I, I just wanted to say that up front so that I don't have to say that after each one of you speaks because it's true for each one of you. So thank you, Dan. And if we if you jump off, we'll understand and go to your jury trial. All right, I appreciate it. Uh, everyone have a great weekend. Enjoy the snow and uh, get out there because uh, it sounds like a big one is coming, so. Good, thank you. Thank you, everyone. So I'm gonna jump to Kate next because I know Kate has, is it in school and has a limited uh, time here right now. So Kate, do you wanna introduce yourself and say whatever you wanna say? Sure, um, I'm Kate McCann. I teach here at U32 High School in Montpelier. I'm very grateful and appreciative uh, to have been selected to advocate and represent um, my colleagues around the state who are uh, both in the classroom and have retired um, and, and are out of the classroom now. Um, I guess I would add to what Dan said um, that it, it was a lot of hard work and we heard a lot of testimony and we heard uh, we were listening to uh, understand the scope of the problem. Um, we were investigating the different levers um, and possible solutions. We looked at some possible revenue streams for how to um, pay for paying down the pension problem. And um, we also heard from uh, Tom Galanka with VPIC um, to talk about the Vermont Pension Investment Committee. Um, I think for me, sitting there each time uh, and being part of this process, um, I, I came always with the lens um, about the role that the pension system plays on the retention and recruitment of teachers. Um, for, for me, yes, we have a pension problem, but the, um, the, the crisis is really in the workforce. We have a lot of unfilled positions around the state um, for positions that are unfilled when we are interviewing where we, we used to get maybe 20 applicants. Now it, it's hard to find three applicants and of those three applicants, uh, maybe one or none of them are really qualified to do the job. So we have big shortages in um, special education. I know here we don't have a driver's ed teacher, which is sort of low on the priority, but um, we, we do have young people who want to become drivers. So, so we've got issues just about everywhere in the state. And I know that the pension system is... Um, is a tool. It's it's one of the tools. It's uh, for the, you know, to um, for overall comp compensation for the work that teachers do in the state. So, um, thank you for the opportunity to to speak with you here today, and thank you, Jeanette, for um, for chairing the the task force. Thank you, Kate. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Kate, stay with us as long as you want. Um, we'll understand when you have to pop off. So I think I'm gonna to jump to Leona next. And um, one of the things before Leona introduces herself, I wanna say that Leona was kind of our um, social calendar director. I'm not sure that that's the right word, but at one point Leona suggested that maybe a way to get us um, excited and motivated. And we had, she suggested a secret Santa exchange among the task force members. And at first I thought, no, I was, and then we embraced the idea and it was so much fun. It really was fun. And the gifts were thoughtful and showed that people were paying attention and kind of understood who each other were and stuff. So thank you, Leona, for being our social director. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so do you want to introduce yourself and um, so, <coughs> tell, okay. say whatever you want to say? Okay. Hi, everyone. Oh, uh, I, wait, wait. Oh, Senator uh, Paul uh, Polina has a question. You're muted, though, Anthony. Are you calling in from Barbados or something? 
<laughs> no, I just love this background. Um, <laughs> that's a good one, though. I wish I was. Um, hello, everyone. I am Leona Watt with VSERS, and I'm also a um, senior probation officer out of Springfield Probation and Parole. And um, it has been a journey since July on the, the task force. Um, you know, we came together and I think, you know, it was sort of like, like, we want this and then you want this. And it was just sort of like getting, and I think someone already mentioned it. It's a getting to know you point. And we really got to know each other over the last six months and really understanding. And I, I've said this before really understanding this is not, not about labor versus the legislature. This is about those who care about Vermont trying to do the best for Vermont's future. That includes the legislature and those of us who are Vermonters or contribute to the Vermont system. So this is about caring about Vermont and getting on that, that equal footing of, we're all here for the same purpose. It's just that we're just saying, you know, for the labor side and me um, representing visas, we're just asking for the least amount, least amount of hit, the hit to our pension system and how can we work together to get to a, on equal footing. And I feel that the plan that we have recommended is a great plan to get on some solid footing for the Vermont pension system. And um, I'm excited for this season. I call it the season, the season of pension moving this along because um, <laughs> there's been a lot of work put into it. Um, a lot of work, a lot of meetings. And um, I do, and I think I'm not gonna just go over it again, but I do appreciate everything that everybody who was on the, the task force contributed and it was nice getting to know everyone and I just feel like this plan is a good solid plan. Thank you Leona and to you as well stay with us as long as you want but we understand that um, there are times when you just have to pop off and go to work so but stay with us as long as you would like. Thank you Leona. So Eric. Well, th thank you Madam Chair. Um, I'd also like to thank this committee. Um, first and foremost, I, I felt like um, you all took a really thoughtful approach at thinking about this issue last session. And um, I also want to thank everyone on the task force, the legislators, um, my fellow labor members, and uh, also uh, Michael from the treasurer's office. Um, I thought everyone um, really brought um, creative solutions to the table. Everyone was really engaged in the process in a, in a, in a very collaborative um, manner. I mean, there certainly was um, getting to know you periods. Um, but, and I'd also like to thank, uh, thank our members for um, staying engaged in the process and um, letting me know how they felt about certain aspects of, of, uh, of our discussions at various points in time. Dan, I'm glad to hear um, how your membership has responded. I think um, we've definitely heard a lot from members um, and they're not all size of relief. Um, so I do just wanna recognize that this, this recommendation looks, <laughs> looks a lot different than maybe some of the proposals that, that um, I came out last year, but I, you know, I don't want to minimize the sacrifice of, of our members um, in, in um, it, that, that, that's embodied in this, in this agreement. Um, for me, um, I, I think a successful or a, um, to have success in this process um, would be an agreement that recognizes the pensions are incredibly important um, to employees as the foundation of their retirement as a huge part of their compensation as employees, but also um, really important to the state. As, as Kate said, um, you know, there are acute workforce issues right now and um, the pensions are really important to uh, retaining and recruiting employees. So if, if we were gonna get to a place that I think we got to in the end, I think all parties were going to have to recognize that it's it's important to um, 
important to everyone in the, in the state of Vermont that, that we address this issue. And that means that everyone is gonna have to come together and see what they can pitch it, do to pitch in to um, put the pensions in a better place. And I think um, what we were able to come together um, on at the end of the day does that, it represents that. Um, I do just wanna say we were, we were really, you know, uh, working on this feverishly at the end. And I, I do wanna, I think we'll have to really pay attention to the legislative text as it's drafted and, and make sure everything encompasses um, our, what we discussed in the task force. I know I've had some uh, members reach out about uh, group C and mandatory retirement age versus normal retirement age. So I just, I just wanna, um, you know, put, put that out there that um, we'll really have to pay attention to how the details are captured in the legislative text. But um, I'm really proud of where we got to um, at the end of, the, at the end of this, this long process. And I'm really proud of um, every other member on the task force for what they brought to the table. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to, we, st we, have, our th we have three of the task force members here with us. I, I just wonder if, um, as long as they're able to stay with us for a few more minutes, if any of you have any questions for them, if they're willing to take any questions. Yes, Senator Polina. Yeah, I don't know if this is a question you can answer or not, but I'm wondering whether when this task force, when you were appointed to the task force and you just started going to the meetings, by the time you left, was there anything that kind of surprised you where you went in and realized like, oh, I didn't know that. This was something that you hadn't thought about that maybe helped form the direction that you thought we should go in. Like something that surprised you to learn about the pensions or about the process. Anybody? Something that surprised me was I didn't realize um, what uh, aspects affected which things, like which, which things would reduce ADEC, which would reduce unfunded liability, which played into OPEB, all of that. Like, so if, for instance, like if increasing contributions for teachers, what effect does that have on reducing the problem? Those, those were some of the questions that got answered along the way. Yeah. Thanks. Any, Eric, Leona? Um, I think, for me, I'm just making sure I'm unmuted. <laughs> That's always my concern. Um, I think for me, it was just a really, um, cause I've been to the state house before, you know, and I've been to hearings and sat there, but really just, um, just seeing how, you know, with the, the information and trying to get through the information and try to come to a consensus. Um, that was a very intriguing process and it, I wasn't, expecting the, that type of process. And I'm just really glad to know that process and understand what you guys do with when you're at the state house. It was great to get a little more um, behind the scenes, so to speak, on how these, how your different committees um, work, because um, it was interesting. It was a very interesting and I learned a lot, a lot. And also how as, as legislators, we're often thrown into issues that we don't know a lot about until we start dealing with them. So it is kind of interesting all the time. Yes. There's people think people think we actually know what we're doing on these issues all the time. We don't, they don't, they don't forget that. <laughs> you need to remember that we're, we're learning as we go along as well. Yeah. Eric, did you have anything to add to that? I, I would say I really, I, I got an appreciation um, uh, a, a deeper appreciation for the legislative process. Um, and um, also um, I, I sit on the uh, board of the retirement system. So I felt like on the pension side of things, I, I uh, you know, I, I, I connected the dots, I think, um, but connecting that to the state budget, I think, um, I think that was, um, I, I learned a lot, a lot there and how the different committees interact. Um, and you know, just how um, going back to the legislative process piece, how people um, can bring different perspectives to the table and um, work collaboratively, collaboratively within those to develop a kind of a shared understanding. Um, it was um, 
it, it was a, it was it was a long process. It was it was it was certainly uh, tough at many times, but um, it was a really rewarding uh, process at the end of the you know at the end of the, our our journey. So I, I'm going to say something, and then I go to Senator Clarkson. But one of the things that um, at our last uh, pension task force meeting, which I guess it was a week ago, Monday now, no, the, this Monday, the 10th, um, it was just then. <clears throat> Michael Neal from the Troopers Association said um, that he was. Um, I, I don't know who's sending chats here, but we don't use chats and I can't read them on my iPad. So if you're trying to chat with me, it, uh, it doesn't work. So <laughs> and, anyway, we don't use chat in here. I should have mentioned that before. But um, one of the things that Mike pointed out was that when we set up the task force to begin with, we had six um members representing the employees and the teachers and the retirees and six members not representing them. And Mike said he was very concerned about that because what if there was a tie vote and how would we deal with that? And I said, we are not gonna have a tie vote. We are gonna have a unanimous vote or we're not gonna have a, a vote. And we did. So he, he reminded us of that, that we did not need to have a tiebreaker because unless we came out of here with unanimity, it was not, it really wasn't what the, the right solution. So Senator Clarkson, did you? Yes, I, I, I have a question. And I, uh, again, I just applaud you all for your work uh, together and coming to consensus and all of our new appreciations for each other and how we all impact the system. and. Uh, how Vermonters help, you know, how we all pay for it in many ways together. Um, I guess my question to you is sort of goes to Eric's point, which is uh, we know that not all the members are sighing a sigh of relief. And so my question to the three of you is, uh, how are you involved in the education rollout so that people understand your work and understand the, the, the decision and the package you have helped put together and that we're all invested in. And what, you know, what's the plan with education? Leona, did you, I saw you waving your finger. Yes, I've spent a lot of time um, on Facebook because we have a Facebook, a private Facebook group for VSEA. And the last week I have spent so much time um, going in there, we, we're having, um, We've had a meeting, you know, like a here, you know, not a hearing, but a, a VSEA meeting just to have people ask questions, be able to explain the decisions that were made. Um, but I've spent a lot of time on Facebook and in our pension group just saying, hey, this is the reasons why. I was like, these are the comparisons. It took a long time. If you go back, it's all on all on YouTube. Go through all the hearings. <laughs> yeah, since July, we've been doing this. We've been every week, you know, when we've been in set in, in session with the um, meetings. This was not a simple process. This was not rushed. These things were thought out. They were argued about. I think some tears were shed. No, I'm just joking. But um, these are <laughs> things that we didn't just pull out of the air. We took time. We talked. We talked. And we talked some more. So uh, explaining that, getting that out there, because that's what I think Eric and I, we've been doing, and our um, the management and leadership for VSA have been doing all week. It has been a, a full week. <laughs> um, so it's just been basically making those connections when people email and have questions, responding to those questions, responding to the Facebook comments, because, you know, we do have those. We should have no changes. And I just go on there. Well, if we can bury our head in the sand, that would be great, but we're not going to do that. <laughs> so, um, and that's when I, I tell people, they're like, Leona, I'm like, I'm putting on my probation officer hat. I'm going to have to treat you. Listen, we don't do this. We deal with the problems. <laughs> we don't just hide away and say, oh, I'm going to look and I'll say, I don't like it. We don't do that. We deal with it and move forward. Kate, did you, oh, I think Kate had something oh, yeah. to add to that. Sure. I would just add that, um, Vermont NEA is, and with, with, um, 
Molly, Andrew, and I have put together a contributions calculator so that our members can type in, you know, what their base salary is, and it will kind of tell them what they're what they can expect to pay um, in in increased contributions. So I think that's going to be helpful for folks. Uh, we have all along the process since last spring, we've had a group of folks. <clears throat> local leaders, local association pension organizers, we call them LAPOs. Um, and that group has been meeting <laughs> every month um, at, along the process and, and even more often during um, the, the more trying times. And so uh, those local uh, association pension organizers have been spreading the word all along. Um, we met with them just after um, we reached uh, the recommendations. We, we, we had our vote and shared the plan with them. Um, and a large, large majority believe that this is um, a, a win for retirees. And I don't mean a win like us versus legislature or us versus state or, or anything like that, but just in terms of like, this is something that we can walk away with and, and rest more soundly that we have shored up the retirement system for, for those who will enter into the system anytime soon. Um, and then last but not least, we, we anticipate holding a town hall for our members on um, Monday, the 24th, I believe that's a Monday, um, after next week's uh, hearing or whatever we're calling that in the evening. Um, oh, the we'll public hearing. That answers some more questions, yes. So we'll have our own town hall after that public hearing. Thanks, Kate. And I'm gonna ask Eric if he has anything to add and then I'll, okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I would like to, um, to add a little bit, Madam Chair. Um, uh, the SEA um, had a uh, member education meeting. Um, see, the recommendations were released on Monday. We, we held it on Tuesday. Um, so we had a, we had a pretty fair turnout, turnout for that meeting. Um, BSEA, um, uh, the office itself has been sending out communications both on Monday and Tuesday, summarizing the recommendations. And, uh, those communications, um, have had, um, myself and Leona as a point of contact on them. So, uh, we've been spending a lot of time talking to members both via email and um, uh, spending a lot of time on the phone as well. Um, people emailing and saying, you know, can, can you give me a call? I'd really like to just to, to talk through this with you. Um, so anyone who, who reaches out and wants to know more about how we arrived at the process and, and why we supported the recommendations uh, that we did, uh, we've, been, we've, we've been engaging with those folks. Um, and that doesn't mean we've, we've convinced everyone that we've talked to, but um, I, pe I think people appreciate it either way. Um, so just a lot of engagement with members is, is um, how we've been communicating why we supported the recommendations we did. So I, I, before I go to Senator Rom Hinsdale, I'm gonna say that the same question could be asked about us because there are 180 of us and there were five on the five legislators on the task force. So there are 175 other people out there, including the four of you on this committee that weren't involved in all of that. And so our job is to convince those 175 other people that this is the, that this is the package that we need to support. So it isn't just, it's, it's us convincing our colleagues also. Well, and, so, and, and people should know we've begun that. Yes, we have. That process but, has begun and has been robust, so. Yeah. So Senator Rom Hinsdale, did you have a question? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, um, I, I hope we can enlist your help if it hasn't already happened to put the Tuesday pension here on your Facebook groups and communication channels for folks. I started to tell some teachers and they hadn't seen it. So that would be great. And then if it's possible for us to listen into the town hall um, I understand if not, but it might be helpful for us if it's a somewhat public to, to hear what folks have to say. Um, so that's an aside. My question is, I was surprised to learn from Chris Roop when we got feedback in the beginning of session um, that workforce turnover is probably one of the biggest factors in um, what has contributed to this unfunded liability. Did, did you all get to talk about that? Um, that's, I, I know faces are looking confused, but that's what Chris said. No, I think that um, 
I think that it was the demographic, and I'll let Chris answer that, but I think it was the the experience of the demographic, the, the um, people retiring, there are more people who are retiring. It isn't turnover. It's people, more so people not retiring. Chris. Huh? Oh, I'm, I can. Yeah. M Madam Chair, Chris. if I may, yeah. uh, Chris Roop, Joint Fiscal, uh, the, yeah, the, one of the biggest uh, drivers in, in both systems was the demographics and, and net turnover, we, we would consider a demographic um, factor. Okay. It really played out big on the teacher system, especially. And what, when we talk about net turnover, we, what that really means is fewer people left earlier in their careers for reasons other than retirement than, than assumed, and more people worked until retirement and left okay. upon retirement than was assumed. So when you go back over the last decade or so, it, this all comes down to the theme of the workforce behavior just was different than what the actuaries assumed it would. You know, okay. the teaching workforce has contracted and uh, there's been uh, retirement incentives and things like that in, in prior years that, that has added to um, pension obligations. Okay, well, I had, I had wondered if the um, struggle to find teachers to fill positions um, you know, was something that you thought the legislature should look at in the larger context of who we are as the, you know, as employers in the state. Um, if you felt like you wanted to share something with the legislature about why you think you're having so few people apply to become teachers and if it's something we can improve. I guess that's for you, Kate. I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? Um, yeah, we, you know, we were talking. I mean, I think I think state employees are facing the same issue. We just heard it more starkly from you that um, you're you're having a hard time attracting people to positions, whereas in the past there'd be much more competition, um, and that you know will, is going to continue to put a strain on the workforce. Um, is there anything you want to say to the legislature about how to help make these positions? more attractive as because this committee is essentially the kind of employer of state employees and you know how but not of teachers no yeah but not of teachers i i think that right now the two biggest worries that people have are are their health and well-being of of themselves and their families and then this this pension system so i think um Seeing this move through the legislature and onto the desk of the governor uh, would be a great message sent to young teachers that that maybe they've made a good choice and and that the the promise that um, that there would be this you know system for them when they retire is is going to be kept and that there's this new. Um, I mean, Peter Fagan wouldn't say it's new because he continues to tell me that the bill has been paid, but there's sort of like this new commitment um, with the, the, the above the ADEC payments um, suggested in these recommendations that uh, allows one to believe uh, whether they're a new educator or have been here a while like myself, um, that the system will be there for them when it's time for them to retire. I, th I think that that goes a long way. Um, we've also had a, a recent win with the healthcare after it went through arbitration and things like that, that um, you know, we can keep the costs low uh, at least for a couple more years, but that's, that's a rising concern. And even though we, we get these little wins every now and then, um, you know, universal healthcare would, would go a long way and, and helping us as well. So, you know, just figuring out a way to make prescription affordable and, and whatever. And now, now we have this new, new problem, right. With COVID. And, um, I, this is what I put in the chair, the chat, Senator white was that uh, right. if you have any ability whatsoever yep. to help us continue with surveillance testing, um, and, and also help us get the best masks uh, possible for, for staff and students, um, it, it would be greatly appreciated. And I know I'm just sort of using my time here and putting in this plug, but um, we're struggling. We're struggling with mental health. We're struggling with, uh, with sickness and, and we're struggling just to sort of keep our heads above water right now. And like, like a lot of people, so thank you. Thanks, Kate. And I think that we saw also that <clears throat> um, DOC, for example, the Department of Corrections is staffed at about 56%. And there have been 
there are ongoing conversations around um, bonus. Bye, Kate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so there, and this committee has made the um, commitment to continue to work with state employees and particularly DOC right now to, to try and figure out how to move forward. It, Madam Chair, so, if I could add to that, I sure. was going to pick up on um, for the, the continued work that, that you just um, alluded to. Um, I think turnover, um, the cost of that on the retirement plan has been more of an issue on the teacher side, but um, on this, for the state employees plan, um, there have been costs related to retirements. And um, this is a very challenging um, time for, uh, you know, people who have their years in to say, okay, you know, staffing levels are down. All of this stuff has changed about my job. I'm going to, I'm going to keep going. Um, we've, we've, um, the part of the recommendations is directing the VSERS board of trustees to both look at uh, group G, this a, a, a potential plan for correctional officers to deal with the, 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 the stressful nature and the turnover associated with that job. Um, but the other uh, item that, that it was directed for additional work was um, trying to pursue a incentive for group F that would um, entice people to keep uh, to keep working after they have their years in. Um, we were able to construct something for Group C in the recommendations, just because the retirement behavior of Group C is different. Um, but for Group F, it will take a little bit more work. But the actuarial um, analysis showed there's the potential for cost savings there. So we we have to think carefully about how that's structured. Um, but that is a very, um, that, that is a concrete way where we could um, work to reduce those um, demographic costs to the retirement plan. And it's, it's something that um, really does make sense to pursue. So we, we'd you. be able to report back to you um, with, with more information on that at, at yep. a later point. So we have Chris with us. So Thank you, Leona and Eric, and again, for all of your hard work and um, the civil and respectful nature that I think we, we were able to um, pull this off with. Okay, all right, thank you. You Bye -bye. can stay as long as you want, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I have to go to another meeting, but thank you. Have a good okay. afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Leona. Thank you, Madam Chair, for all of your work through this process and leadership and, um, you know, steering the ship in the right direction and, and um, helping to get us to where we got to at the end of the, the, end of the day. Thank you. We, we, it, your okay. role was critical. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are going to committee, by, we are going to be joined by uh, Jane Kitchell at around two. I have no idea what time it is right now. She's gonna it join us. About quarter of. Okay, she's going to join us around two, just to remind us about the, because um, now that we've had a chance, or hopefully everybody has had a chance to read the report, or at least read the summary and the kind of packages and all of that, Jane is going to join us again to talk about, um, remind us the state's commitment here and how that fits together and how, how we're um, looking at where the money comes from and how, um, how we go forward with that. And then Andrew is going to join us at about 2.30. He's gonna take a little break from his kindergarten kids and join us then so that he can share his thoughts. Um, so what I'd like to do, I guess, is- um, Gail has- Gail? Yes, I see. I just Thank wanted you. to add Gail. another couple of schedule notes. Rebecca oh. Wasserman will be joining us at two. Uh, okay. Treasurer Pierce will be joining us at three. Okay, great. And then we can have Mike Ferrant at the end of the day if we have any questions about the logistics for the Tuesday hearing. Oh, great, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess, Chris, um, if you want to go, I know that this gets a little repetitive sometimes and we have to go over it many times, but um, some of us 
I see Eric is still on there. So some of us have had the um, pleasure of going over this stuff for eight months. And this committee has not had that pleasure. And so I think we need to just make sure that everybody gets their questions answered and feels comfortable with where we're going and everything. So Chris, if you would like to um, join us, I know that you put some, together some slides for, so if you would like to do that. And we don't normally um, uh, do screen share here, but I think we will on this one, just because I think it's going to be, yes, Allison. So Chris, you had said you were, had put together a summary uh, that was several pages long. And I think I found it uh, at the JFO website. Um, and it, 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 it's, it, it's not really, it's not a, a wordy, it's not like Becky's, it's not a, a narrative. It's, is that what you're going to be sharing with us today? So I had some slides that, that put things into a little more readable format than the one page document. Yeah. And they're up on the, the Senate GovOps uh, committee uh, webpage under Wednesday's date, um, because I, I prepared them thinking that we would have time on Wednesday to go through them, but it's the same slides. So, and is that what we're going to do now? It, if if the sure. chair would like me to, I'm happy to do so. Yeah, why why don't you to answer the questions? And I I will say I know that um, the the summary that uh, Becky put together at the very beginning of the report and kind of a summary thing is is good and it's good to have the narrative kind of. But what people what teachers and state employees want to do is look at the detail. They don't care so much about the the summary. And we also need to be comfortable with, with those. So um, I would ask Chris to go, and, and we don't normally do uh, screen share, but I think in this case, that that's the easiest way to do it. And, if and that's sorry. okay with the committee. Yeah. And just, it's going to be the overview of the final recommendations. Is that what you're doing? Those that's, slides? That's correct. We'll see when soon he puts them up. No, no, I got them pulled up. That's, that's great. It. Thanks. <laughs> okay. It's easier to read on my, I'm so blind. Okay, okay Chris. Okay. Gail, does he have the ability to share his? Oh, I guess he does. All right. You can see that. All right. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. For the record, uh, Chris Roop from the Joint Fiscal Office. So I have just a few slides here that, that walk through the recommendations and put some preliminary fiscal estimates around uh, those recommendations. So um, just as a quick refresher, um, you know, the, the, when you all passed Act 75 last session, you created this task force. And one of the explicit charges of the task force was to develop recommendations to reduce the ADAC. So that's the actuarial determined employer contribution, the, the bill to the state for the pension system every year, and reduce the unfunded liabilities by somewhere between 25 and 100% of the size of the year over year growth we saw from FY21 to FY22. The numbers over here on the right uh, show you what that translates to. So the 25% the uh, and the 100% values for each system are reflected in that little blue chart on the uh, right. And, and the, the packages of recommendations do get within, within those ranges. Um, uh, as, as Senator White mentioned, the recommendations were unanimously agreed to on Monday's uh, meeting. The recommendations were put forth by um, the employee groups. Um, the, the, the levers that were studied under by the actuaries were levers that were suggested by the employee groups, and uh, the employee groups put forth their, uh, their recommendations. And uh, we were wordsmithing uh, these recommendations through the weekend, through Monday, through the task force meeting itself. So uh, as soon as we pivoted away from that, we, we then immediately turned to trying to put some numbers together once we knew exactly what the recommendations would be. So that's why they're in, they're in separate documents. But the recommendations contain a combination of uh, employee contribution increases, changes to the benefit primarily uh, around cost of living adjustments, commitments of additional state funding to pay down retirement liabilities, and pre-funding OPEB, the other post-employment benefits. That's the subsidized retiree healthcare benefits. Much of the savings that are expected from the pension changes and the higher employee contributions 
are essentially redirected into shoring up the long-term retirement liabilities. And combined, and something that I think is very interesting and very notable about these recommendations is they create a path forward to the state reducing its long-term unfunded retirement liabilities by about $2 billion. And that, that is just tremendous for, for a state the size of Vermont. And, and the caveat down here applies, you'll see it throughout my slides, that all of our fiscal estimates are preliminary um, and, and they may fluctuate due to additional actuarial analysis, some timing issues, or you know, the gains and losses we see from other factors. But we have a good estimate of, of what um, a lot of these recommendations are likely to generate from prior actuarial analysis and some internal um, analysis. There have been some things in the recommendations that we didn't previously cost out, but once uh, we have a little more definitive language, we can do so and, and, and get a little more specific on exactly which fiscal year we'd realize the savings in, in the ADAC math. But right now, these are some preliminary numbers just to give you a sense of the scale and the sense of how much the, the sort of needle moves from each element of the recommendations. So Chris, can I ask a couple of questions? You can. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate this report. It's very helpful for me. And I don't have the advantage, as our chair mentioned, of having basically lived this for the last eight months. So some of my questions may seem pretty rudimentary, but here we go. Um, point number four, much of the savings from pension changes and higher employee contributions redirected. Could I look at that as a layperson as sort of taking advantage of compounding interest? Yes. Okay, I thought so, <laughs> but that's great to hear. And um, the next point down, combine the recommendations, reduce, is that by 2 billion by 2038? Or what is the date that you're looking at? Now that, that's $2 billion within the next year or so. Oh. So uh, the, the biggest uh, component of that savings would be realized, and we'll get into this, but it will be realized through the pre-funding of the OPEB benefits. So right now we do that on a pay-as-you-go basis, which in the short term is the cheapest course of action, but in the long term is the most expensive course of action for the very thing you touched on about the ability to, to take advantage of compound interest. Okay. So by pre-funding, we, we're, we're basically, the, the sort of crux of this whole thing is um, the savings the employer would see from some of the pension benefit changes are essentially being plowed back into the retirement liabilities by freeing up the budget capacity needed to pre-fund the OPEB and make what we'll refer to as a plus payment on the unfunded li pension liability payments moving forward. So the more we pay down sooner, the, the more we save in interest costs long term because we get to take advantage of that compound interest. Thank you very much. All right, let's take a look at slide three and, and I'll start by going through some of the, the VSERS recommendations and then we'll wrap up with the teacher recommendations. But something really important to note is with all these recommendations, uh, there were no changes proposed to currently retired or terminated vested members, people who are not actively employed and, and paying into the system. Uh, these are groups of people who um, have completed their service. They, they sort of left with, with the, the understanding of what their benefit would be. And uh, most of the changes really just apply to, to current actives and um, future hires. And a lot of the um, changes, uh, which we'll get into more, particularly around the COLA, uh, the recommendation would not apply to actives who are eligible for normal retirement eligibility as of July 1 in, in an effort to not encourage people to retire sooner than they otherwise would. Um, the the VSERS recommendations call for some phased in higher employee contribution rates over a period of time. Um, changes to the uh, relatively modest uh, changes to the cost of living adjustment uh, formula that's currently used. Calls for the state making a $75 million one-time payment toward the pension unfunded liability. When you all passed the budget last year, you reserved $150 million in the general fund last year and fenced it off pending um, recommendations on, on pension underfunding. The recommendations call for taking half of that 150 million and putting it into each of the systems. So each would get 75 from that 150. The recommendations call for the state to um, commit to making what, what we'll refer to as an ADEC plus payment beginning in FY24 and growing to $15 million in FY26. 
and remaining at that level until the pension system reaches 90% funded. So this would essentially be the state committing to making an additional payment of up to $15 million toward the unfunded liability payment that the actuaries recommend. So we sort of accelerate our progress toward paying that unfunded liability down and that also saves us interest costs long term because we can take advantage of compound uh, investment returns instead. Um, Pre-funding the OPEB benefits. And um, as, as Eric mentioned and, and Leona mentioned earlier, um, commitments uh, for uh, future recommendations to be made on um, Department of Corrections uh, benefits, what, what we'll refer to as Group G, and some longevity incentives. So. Slide four starts getting into the numbers. Um, and, and this uh, slide really focuses on the, the recommended proposed employee contribution rates. So the, the recommendation calls for beginning in FY23, rates to be in, increased incrementally in a phased manner. So group C um, is the law enforcement group. That's about 450 members. Um, their recommendation was to um, have half a percent increases phased in over a three year period. So uh, one of the thinking, one of the, the important considerations for why phasing this in is because uh, you know you have contractual wage increases that are phased in over time as well. So if you're also phasing in an incremental um, increase in the the pre-tax contribution rate, you you negate the concern of somebody taking home less pay than they than they otherwise would because they're they're getting the the higher uh, contractual wage increase offsets a great deal of the, the higher contribution increase. Group D and Group F. Group D is the judges. That's around 50 active members. And Group F is the largest group. That's ev everybody else that doesn't fit into Group C and Group D. Um, the proposal was for Group D's contribution increases to mirror the construct that's recommended for Group F. And the, um, the, the general construct that was put forth by uh, the VSEA members for, for Group F is to really try to have a, a tiered and progressive approach to this, where um, people whose uh, income salary income levels are in the, the bottom quartile wouldn't see a change, and the change would escalate for, for people in the other three income quartiles. And uh, just as, a, as a, a, a sense of what those quartiles roughly correspond to, I put those salary levels at the bottom there. But the, the sort of key theme here is that higher employee contributions offset the normal cost. So um, if you remember, whenever the pension plan assumptions changed about a year ago, the normal cost increased a great deal because of the lower assumed rate of return and the revised demographic assumptions. So um, employee contributions go toward the normal cost, but they do not fully fund the normal cost. They, they currently cover about half of it across both systems, across all active groups. This contribution rate would increase would essentially offset some of the higher normal costs that we saw. So the, in layman's terms, the price of the pension benefit went up when the assumptions changed. So the employee contribution rates are going up to help offset that increase in the, the pension benefits. Um, that would save employer costs because the, the piece of the normal cost that employee contributions are insufficient to cover gets funded by the employer through the ADAC. So if you have more money coming in through employee contributions, you realize commensurate savings on the employer ADAC cost. Slide five gets into the, the recommendations around the proposed um, changes to the cost of living adjustments and benefits. So for group C, again, that's the law enforcement and group F, that's pretty much everybody else. It's about 95% of the universe. Um, the, the proposal is that beginning in July, um, the COLA structure would be modified by reducing the current 1% minimum and 5% maximum of the net change in the consumer price index that we use for calculating the COLA to a 0% minimum and a 4% maximum. And also extending the period of time that one must be retired before they receive their first COLA from the current 12 month minimum to a 24 month minimum. And an important uh, thing, an uh, uh, important provision, which is why it's highlighted in red is that um, the recommendation calls for exempting active employees who are eligible for normal unreduced retirement as of July 1st from those changes. For group C, 
um, Group C's benefit looks a little different. Um, they uh, also, uh, unique to them, recommended um, increasing the mandatory retirement age from 55 to 57. This does not mean people are required to work from 55 to 57. Group C members are currently eligible for unreduced early retirement at age 50 if they have at least 20 years of service. Virtually all the active Group C members retire early on an unreduced benefit at age 50 because of that reason. So very, very few members, only a handful, work into their 50s. So um, one the, the key theme between these two provisions is to try to encourage people to voluntarily work in to a later age than they otherwise would. So increasing the mandatory retirement age from 55 to 57 gives you a little more breathing room on that. And it, it uh, corresponds and aligns with a recommendation that was put forth in the law enforcement uh, retirement benefit uh, study group from a few years ago. And this increase of the max benefit cap, you know, right now, Group C members, every year of service they work, their benefit multiplier is two and a half percent. And their max benefit cap is 50% of their average final compensation. So this means that if you have 20 years of service, you hit your 50% of max benefit cap because 20 times 2.5% gets you to the 50. So if you keep working beyond age 50, when, when you're first eligible for unreduced retirement, your benefit only goes up through your salary growth beyond that point. This um, proposed change to, to allow people to increase their max benefit by one and a half percent for each extra year they work beyond age 50 allows a benefit accrual to continue at a, at a slightly reduced level. And I see Eric's got his hand raised and I would certainly welcome him to, to jump in. Yeah, please do Eric. Um, yeah, I, um, Chris, I just wanted to um, address um, the um, mandatory retirement age around group C. Um, it, 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 it's something that I didn't necessarily appreciate fully, um, but I know um, Dan um, spoke to this when, when we were um, endorsing the final recommendations that, um, you know, the idea of not forcing people to work longer. Um, I think the way that we had talked about that recommendation as a task force is that people could have the option to work till 57. I know there are a group, there, there's, there are a group of um, members who maybe began their work, um, career working at another law enforcement agency and then um, came to the state of Vermont and they do not qualify for the unreduced early retirement because uh, they don't have 20 years in. Right. Um, but they, if, if the mandatory retirement age is 57 without a normal retirement age, because right now they're linked. Um, mandatory is 55 and um, it, th that's irregardless of how many years of service um, you, you put in. So we need to think, we need to make sure that we, when we codify this, um, we're not creating a um, burden on some members that they would in fact have to work longer to um, not have their benefits reduced. Yeah, no, that, that's an excellent point, Eric. And, and, and yeah, to reiterate, there's no, there's no element of this proposal that requires um, anybody to work longer or, or changes the existing um, ability to retire early with an unreduced benefit at age 50 with at least 20 years of service. What this does is provide an avenue for people to continue working at a later age than they otherwise would without, um, without you know, while, while being able to benefit a little bit on the pension side, because uh, the, the pensions save money by not having to pay that extra year of benefits out um, if somebody voluntarily agrees to work an extra year. So I'm going to comment on the retirement age. I've been working on retirement committees and different things law enforcement issues for a number of years. And we've been scratching our heads, trying to change that retirement age, mandatory retirement age from 55. And then it was just done with a snap of the finger by Dan. So <laughs> I have a great deal of appreciation for that, regardless of the impact on the pension system. <laughs> I mean, in addition to the, the impact on the pension system. And I don't think there's a, there would be any um, adverse impact if um, 
normal retirement was kept at 55 for Group C, but they those members weren't forced to retire at that age. Um, I think that would remedy um, the concern that I've heard from multiple Group C members. Um, you know, saying, "Well, I don't, I, you know, make sure you understand that um, <coughs> this would actually force me to work longer to have unreduced benefits." So. Um, would, we just need to be very conscious of that language in the, in, the, in the ultimate bill. I look at it as similar to being social security kind of thing where you get a certain benefit if you retire at a certain age, but you don't have to. And the longer you similar. delay payment, uh, the, the more money you'll get in the end. Is it sort of the same, uh, Chris? It, it's, it's a similar construct where here, we're not, th this recommendation doesn't take anything away this right. says if you want to work beyond age 50, um, you, that you beyond age 50 or 20 years of service, that that your benefit would go up a little bit more at, it, as a result of your extra year of service. Yeah. OK. Uh, may I ask a question, I, Madam Chair? Uh, yes. OK. I know this is uh, group. What's group A and B? They're, they're legacy groups that are that are not open to active employees. There's one active member left in Group A, and uh, that they're certainly eligible for retirement. Group okay, B but, was the former uh, motor vehicle inspector group, and that's a legacy group, and they're they're not open to active members. Okay, so Group A and B are are either done or or retired and not affected Correct. by this. Correct. So okay, got. Thank you. I was wondering where they were. Mm -hmm. Where are you? Got it. Thank you. And this is actually, Chris, this is so nicely laid out. I just want to give you a kudo. I think you really did a great job on this. You really distilled it. Uh, I mean, there are some issues for those of us in, who are who are not financial wizards, but it really laid it out in good lay terms and made it comprehensible, which is useful. Thank no, you. Thank you. And that's why we're here. So ask, ask all the questions that you want. <laughs> so the last thing I wanna I wanna mention before I move on is, and, and I I want to take a moment to recognize uh, the judiciary and, and Judge Grierson um, that the judiciary came to the table and participated in this process, and they put forth recommendations as well. And and you can see their recommendations here, where um, they they would they would have a slightly different exemption. Um, and they would exempt people who are within five years of, of retirement eligibility or have 15 plus years of service. But they rec their recommendations are not, the group is so small that um, the recommendations are not gonna move the needle very much financially, but for equity reasons and parity reasons, um, what they put forth is pretty significant. So um, that the, these recommendations, uh, you know, in, in sort of layman's terms, would bring the Group D benefit a little bit more in alignment with some of the other groups' benefits. And uh, some of those those key areas are currently the the benefit for a Group D members based on their one year of final salary at retirement. Um, they recommend uh, doing a two year average of their final years, which is similar to what um, Group C has. They have a, an average of the two highest consecutive years. Beginning in FY23, reducing the max benefit from 100% of final salary to 80% of the new AFC. Um, you would have to have 30 years of service under their benefit to hit 100% of, uh, of final salary. So this, you know, again, this is not likely to, to move the needle tremendously financially, but it's a big parity thing. It, Chris, is that 30 years of service as a judge or in the judiciary yes. system? In Group D. So... Yeah. Who's in Group D other than people who it's other than judges. judges? But the, the judges. key, but the but key is it here, where, where, okay, sorry. judges, there are 55 of them. Okay, so it's just judges, it's not people who work in the judiciary system, no. those are VSEA. No. No, 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 they're Group F, they're Group F, and state's attorneys are Group what. I would have to look into that. No, if if they work, if they're paid by the state, they're Group F. If they're paid by the, it depends on what they are, but they are not Group D. The only people in Group D are the judges, okay. not even the magistrates, but the judges. Got it. Okay, yeah, thanks. And, that's, that's helpful. And something really important to keep in mind about Group D is that, you know, 
we we often think we we know many many examples of sort of the rank and file employee that has thirty or more years of service. Group D members enter the workforce at a much later age yes, than, that's than other groups. So you know there's there's not too many that have thirty years of service in group. I was going to say what so okay. I want to ask. And, and then a couple other changes that they recommended for new judges appointed or elected after this July would be to, to raise the retirement age uh, from the current 62 to 65, um, putting a, a limit on the cost of living adjustments where the current formula, which is based on 100% of the CPI, um, would only apply to the first $75,000 of retirement benefit. That roughly corresponds to the average retirement benefit of a group D member. And then a reduced COLA that's calculated at 50% of CPI on benefit amounts above $75,000. And mirroring the other recommendations, um, they recommended uh, uh, delaying the current requirement where you must be in retirement for at least 12 months till you get your first COLA to 24 months. And can you just tell us the acronym AFC? Average final compensation. Oh, average final comp. Okay. Because I was thinking salary and I don't see an S. Okay, I got it. All right. Slide six puts some numbers around uh, these changes based on the preliminary estimates we've we've done through the task force process. So um, pretty conservatively across all the groups, we, we think that um, these changes would save about eight and eight point eight million dollars on the ADAC once they're they're fully rolled in um, and have a, a beneficial impact on the unfunded liability of about a little over fifty eight million dollars of, of reductions. Um, I there's one aspect of here that the group C COLA formula, that 0% uh, uh, minimum, 4% maximum, the actuaries didn't specifically cost that out yet for group C because they just weren't asked to earlier in the process. They did cost it out for group F though. That will result in modest actuarial savings that are not accounted for in this table. But just due to the size of the group, um, that change is not going to move the needle tremendously. And again, I put some, some asterisks and caveats around the group D because we didn't specifically cost out the, the impact of those changes, but I expect them to be pretty de minimis in the big picture because the, it, most of the current um, members would be exempt from the benefit changes. Um, and, and there's just not that many active members that would be paying higher employee contributions. So, Slide seven um, walks through um, the impact of the additional state payments that are recommended. So part of the recommendations call for the state to make a one-time payment of $75 million um, in FY22 um, toward the unfunded liability. That results in savings in your ADAC payments that begin in a two-year lag. So um, that, that, that the impact of that $75 million basically would reduce the amount we would otherwise pay toward our unfunded liability by $7.3 million and have an immediate impact of reducing the unfunded liability by 75 million because it's fairly straightforward that you're, you're making that one-time payment directly in. Um, the recommendation also calls for making the state making an ADAC plus payment that would begin in FY24 and ramp up to a $15 million level by FY26 and remain at that level till the system's hit 90% funded. So in a way, as I mentioned earlier, you're basically redirecting a lot of that savings you see from the benefit, uh, the proposed benefit changes in this one-time contribution into making that plus payment in future years and just accelerating your payment uh, toward paying down this debt. Um, another key element that, of the recommendations you'll see in both uh, systems is currently there's a year-end construct where 50% of the unreserved general fund surplus goes to the state OPEB. Um, last year, we had a pretty robust year-end general fund surplus. So $52 million through that construct went over to the state OPEB as a one-time payment, which is gonna help us begin pre-funding. But going forward, the recommendation is to take that 50% construct and instead split it evenly into the pension systems. So 25% would go into the state pension, 25 into the teacher pension, again, to accelerate progress toward paying down the unfunded liabilities. Chris, yes. Chris, do you talk about a 75 million um, one-time payment? What about this $200 million that I've been hearing about? I'm, I'm gonna get to that in a few slides. Okay, okay. thanks. All right. 
And uh, sorry, one more question, Chris, before you leave this slide. <clears throat> Why do we want to fund something only until it's 90% funded? Why don't we want to fund it up to 100%? The, that is a great question. So systems very rarely stay at 100% funded for long. Um, you will always have actuarial gains and losses from year to year that will cause a fund to slip above or below. 90% is well within the range of what uh, folks who have testified before the committee consider to be a healthy system. Uh, you know, 80% is usually a benchmark of a system that's in relatively good shape. 90% um, is, is a manageable um, uh, gap, if you will, um, for the state to close. And you may get to a point where if you have a really big economic downturn, in the mid 2030s, you may need, and, and you're really well funded. Otherwise, you may need to reamortize your unfunded liability to make your payments more affordable. So 90% is gets you to a very, very robust position, and it's a manageable expense because if you're in a if you're in a situation where it's tied to hundred percent and the system might be 100.5% one year and drop down to 99 the next year, it's going to be a constant yo-yo between when these payments kick in. So 90%, I think, was a, a threshold that a lot of people felt was, was, was a place where the systems would be in, in extremely good financial health. Thanks. Okay, that's a great question, though. Slide eight just walks through the OPEB proposal real quick. So building upon that $52.4 million payment that was made at the end of last year from the year-end general fund construct and uh, begin pre-funding. And pre-funding basically would involve the legislature enacting a statute, um, a pre-funding statute similar to what we have with the pensions, where it says, all right, your unfunded liability is going to be paid off by this date, by this method, and you need to commit to making those payments in the future. The very act of doing the pre-funding schedule and, and enacting that into law and then begin it and, and having that disciplined approach to sticking with it allows us to see a tremendous reduction in our liabilities. And the reason why is because the, the GASB accounting rules require us to discount our liabilities using a 2.2% rate under PAYGO. That 2.2% rate is tied to the average of the 20 year AA municipal bond rate. So obviously what the feds are doing with interest rate policy and what the broader market conditions are can really drive that number in, in ways that are kind of beyond our control. But if we were pre-funding, we could discount our liabilities using the same 7% rate that the pension systems use because we would be investing money a, a, under a statutory construct where we are investing that money under, assume, under an assumed rate of return of 7%. So the very act of changing that discount rate allows us to drop our unfunded liabilities on our balance sheet tremendously. But part of the recommendation also calls for the state to maintain the current pay-go amount that we're already paying to OPEB. So generally the pre-funding, and these numbers will fluctuate a little bit pending further actuarial analysis, but generally the, the pre-funding would add an ongoing cost of 22 to 24 million above what we're currently doing under pay-go. So, Again, this is where the savings we see from some of those pension changes would get reinvested into um, pre-funding the OPEB obligation. And slide nine just has a few other points here where, and, and Eric mentioned this, but there's you're probably going to see the statutory language show up in the BAA because that bill's moving faster than the pension bill will move. But there's going to be some language uh, that directs the treasurer and the VSERS boards of trustees to work on so, two issues and develop recommendations to the legislature by April 15th. One is uh, what would that group G benefit look like for um, uh, correction staff um, in a way that's actuarial, ne actuarially neutral to the pension system and results in no additional employer pension costs. We did some preliminary exploration of this question where uh, we, we asked the actuaries to say, what would it look like if we created a new group G that looks just like the current group C for law enforcement? And the, the number they came back with was, was at a rate in excess of 35% of payroll. So that would just be unaffordable for people. So um, the, I think where, where folks left this was, we need to, it's important to study the issue and provide some recommendations. We need a little more time to do it. And uh, I know the treasurer is working with uh, the employee groups on this process um, as we speak. The other one is around this idea of a longevity incentive that Eric mentioned. 
we we costed out a few things um, during the task force, uh, some ideas about encouraging people to uh, work a little bit longer past the point at which they're eligible for, for retirement. But this could either end up adding costs or saving costs. It all depends on how behavior is likely to change. And uh, the reason why this is a little more complicated for group F than for group C, the law enforcement, is right now, almost everybody retires at age 50 if they have 20 years of service with, with the law enforcement. So the, the actuaries don't assume a whole lot of extra you know, people working into their 50s. So it's much more straightforward that the more you can encourage that behavior, the more likely you are to see savings. It's a different case with Group F. I think we can all think of state employees that could retire and have had that ability to retire for some time, but they continue to work um, out, of, out of dedication, out of the goodness of their heart, out of whatever personal reason causes them to keep working. And the actuaries assume that some percentage of people in Group F are going to keep working past the point at which they can retire um, on reduced benefit. So we need to really understand how much behavior is likely going to change above what we're currently assuming, because otherwise, if behavior doesn't change, the incentive could just work as a benefit enhancement to the people who are already assumed to retire. So that's why this requires a little bit more for further study. So here's some very, very preliminary. Yes, Van. So Chris, um, uh, oh, Allison's fine. Um, the, the, I guess the question is, I know we have identified this for further study. What's our time frame on that? So the, the recommendation is that, that we would ask the treasurer and the, the board of trustees to get back to the legislature by April 15th. And the intent oh, that would be there? that- I just missed it. Oh, there it is by the 15th, yeah. right. Yeah, and the, well, the intent behind that is, yeah, the intent behind that is to give the legislature the ability that once they receive these recommendations and if they deem them acceptable, that they could drop them into the, the broader retirement bill that, that okay. contains all of these other proposed changes. Right, and that would just go through regular GovOps committees rather than going back to the task force? Correct, right. I believe so. The, yes, could because the task force has agreed to that as a condition. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Slide 10 just shows uh, some preliminary cost estimates. And this gets back to Senator Collimore's question earlier about the $2 billion. You could see here on the right that the pension benefit recommendations that I previously ran through conservatively would drop that unfunded liability by about $58 million. That one-time pension contribution is another $75 million. Prefunding OPEB, huge, huge impact, $891 million impact on reducing our unfunded liabilities due to the ability to use that higher discount rate when doing our math. Yeah. But these, these charts are going to be updated, I'm sure, through the legislative process. I know the treasurer is, is going to be working with us and with the actuaries to take these recommendations and as the language gets a little more refined, um, seeing to what extent the, the numbers would change for, for FY23 and the future years. But this just gives you a sense of the magnitude of some of the different um, changes. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because the numbers are preliminary, but I wanted to give you a sense of scope. And uh, if you have any questions about this, uh, happy to answer them offline or dig into further details, but you are gonna see more numbers and you're gonna know what to do with, but by the time this bill makes its way through the legislative process, but these are the preliminary estimates. I see Senator Kitchell uh, joined us and has her hand raised. <laughs> I do, and I don't think I'm muted. Um, I'll no. lower my hand. I, I wanted to go back and um, uh, just respond to Senator Polina's question. Um, I was asked to get involved in this discussion um, toward the end, um, so I had the benefit of all the work of the uh, uh, task force, but um, I would want to call your attention, the 200 million is what we're committing for one time for pensions, and you're asking, well, how come it's only 75? When we were building the budget last year, uh, your appropriations committee, we're really trying to position ourselves to deal with um, both the unfunded liability for pensions as well as 
um, health care benefits. That's why we had the construct um, that at the end of the year surplus for state employees health care, um, that, that half of that um, surplus would go there. And that is where we were able to get that 52.4 million. So when we were looking at the two systems and um, from a fiscal perspective, looking at that economic security, there were two pieces. One is the underfunding of the pension and the second was the underfunding of the healthcare benefit for retired teachers. And that's where you had great divergence. The state um, employees had a much higher underfunding of the healthcare benefit, but less on the pension side. On the other hand, teachers were just the reverse. And so when we were looking at one-time money, we put in, uh, we had the 52.4 that we were putting toward the state employees' healthcare. And then we were we had the 150 million held in reserve. We split that 50-50. And then we added another 50 um, to go on the teacher's retirement side, simply because the underfunding of their pension system was almost $2 billion versus just a little over 1 billion for state employees. So the uh, reason we allocated it that way, but in the end between the cost of the retiree healthcare benefit and the, what we put into pensions came out very close to being equal. So I just wanna um, say that the money was uh, very consciously the one times um, uh, done that way, recognizing the, um, the different underfunding um, uh, conditions for the two different groups. And so that's why we wanted to look at both, although the task force focus originally was on pensions, it moved in the end toward the economic security and the two important components. And that is, and, and the representatives told us this, uh, security around that healthcare coverage was is really important. Um, and that uh, underfunding was at risk. So if there's one thing I don't think that people necessarily thought about when we started this, but for state employees, the pension underfunding was a little over 1 billion, but the underfunding of the healthcare benefit was one point, almost 1.7 billion. So um, that's why uh, from a fiscal and a budgetary perspective, we allocated the one time of that 200 differently, but we then had the other 52.4 from the surplus that we had parked because we knew we needed to start um, a strategy for uh, um, state employees' health care. In addition, uh, for members of the Senate, you will recognize, and it was a, a topic that we just left at the end of the year, we had recommended that we start pre-funding uh, teachers' health care benefit um, out of the Ed Fund for currently employed teachers, not retired. And that's really important for teachers who are working right now who will be getting that health care benefit. That was, I think, about 13.9 million. We couldn't get agreement at the end, so we reserved that. So I think it's important to understand so much of what we did last year to have these dollars in reserve to help us put together a package that addressed um, both elements of our uh, uh, economic security for uh, retirees. So um, I just wanna state that that's why when we're talking about the 200, there will be an additional 50. It'll be directed to where the underfunding of the pension is greater. But then we had the one time at the end of this year, this past fiscal year, that was 52 million that was directed towards state employees, healthcare underfunding. So I encourage everybody to look at it kind of in the aggregate because it was designed to um, recognize the difference of where the risk was the greatest uh, between the two groups and to direct the funding. The other thing that I would say in looking at it was very common, it was very powerful and that is if we, increase our contributions, we want an affirmation that in fact, there will be 
a plan to under uh, to root in a uh, ongoing basis um, buy down the underfunding, and both groups said we want the normal ADEC, but we also want something added to that, and so that's where we came up with um, the. Um, additional 15 million that would go with the ADEC. And just to give you some idea, the normal ADEC um, for state, empo uh, state employees is about 36 million, according to Treasurer Pierce's latest letter. So 15 million against that is, is a fairly significant supplement that will go uh, on an ongoing basis. The way we fund this, and that's why I get back to Senator um, White's comment is this is so all intertwined. And that is by making one-time payments toward the pensions, two years out, we will see a reduction in the amount of the ADEC that goes to paying the amortized under liability um, payment. And we would be putting a fence around those uh, freed up dollars to say, we're keeping them within the system we're directing it to fund that ADEC plus, the plus on the ADEC. So um, that's why um, when we got into the money um, uh, to put this all together, um, it gets rather complicated, but um, it gave us an opportunity to put our fiscal house in order. And I just wanna restate between the um, collectively, we will have had, uh, over a $2 billion impact on reducing the underfunded liability carried on the state's books, which if anything should impress Wall Street, I would think that that would go. But more importantly, it really shores up and stabilizes and starts paying for the first time ever. And it does require more money on the state side. I'm not denying that because we've never pre-funded that healthcare benefit. And we are paying it pre-go, dollar for dollar, having no benefit of compounding return on investments. And it is creating a tremendous pressure on the general fund and what we have for funding available to fund other um, programs, services, and benefits. So I, I just wanna state why that 200 million ended up allocated the way it did because I think that's really important, but also um, you can't look at that in isolation with the other money that got reserved and where, where that was directed. So in the end, the uh, two packages were very, very close around 150 million each. So I'm, I'm going to uh, jump in here and I'm going to make one suggestion that we not, that, um, that we not get so tied up with any one number and any one amount that that we start picking at it because as Jane said it 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 could very 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 easily start to unravel the entire thing and then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to interrupt you Chris for just a moment here I see Eric has his hand up but I want to acknowledge that um, Andrew and Molly have joined us and um, Andrew and Molly, I'm going to have you inter I'm going to have the committee introduce themselves to you, and then you can take it. And we have heard from Dan and Leona, and um, hey. Kate, and Dan, and Eric, and Eric, Dan, mm -hmm. Dan and, and Eric, Leona and Kate, and Eric. And Eric is still with us. So, um, but so I'm going to have the committee. In I'm going to interrupt us here for a while, and do this because I know you're you're jumping away from your kindergarten kids that you're hurting and your fourth graders. So um, we Senator will, White, you, yes. I, I'm just wondering perhaps sort of, since I've explained from our fiscal and budgetary perspective, sort of what we've done, uh, is it all right for me to sign off? No. <laughs> no? Yes, thank you, Jane. Okay. Although I want to say working with the um, all the people that are out there um, from both um, unions, it, it really was um, it really was a very constructive and uh, I, I thought it was it was a, a very positive way of working together to get to 
um, what we have is an agreement here. And so um, as someone who only got dumped in at, toward the end, um, it just, it was, I found it just a real pleasure. <laughs> so I just wanna recognize um, uh, the fact that um, our discussions were very constructive and, um, and um, very positive and, it, and, and that's obviously a tribute to the, uh, to the people that were negotiating. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge um, their, um, their hard work as well. And thank, thank you. I, I would um, may I just say thank you to you too. Oh. I just I just before you hop off, I just want to say thank you so much because uh, it may not be Senate and and House language, but fourth graders would say back at you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Andrew, what would the kindergarten kids say? <laughs> we don't want to hear. We're big on the connection sign, so or like me too. Uh, so we would do that. <laughs> okay. Um, Thank All you, right. Jane. Yeah, thank so, you. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank Thanks. you, too. So I'm going to have the committee introduce themselves. I'm not going to bother introducing myself because if you don't remember who I am now, then um, you've been COVIDing for too long. So committee. I'm Anthony Polina, represent Washington County. Ryan Collimore, representing the Rutland County District. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Tisha Ram Hinsdale, Chittenden County. So Andrew and Molly, if you would like to just introduce yourselves, and um, we heard from, as I said before, we heard from other the other members, and um, they just talked a little bit about how they came to this and um, to whatever you'd like to tell us. So uh, do either of you have a time constraint right now? No. Okay, so Molly, do you? Nope, kids are at PE and she's gonna dismiss for me. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so I'll let whoever wants to start. Okay. You go um, for it, Molly, you were here first. All right, go. Sure. Um, Anthony is in gym, sorry. <laughs> there's, there's never a moment where you aren't interrupted in the classroom, that's the, <laughs> that's the defining the defining characteristic. Um, so my name is Molly Stoner. I teach fourth grade down in Dummerston, just south of Jeanette White. <laughs> and um, so we were able to carpool up to Montpelier a lot this during the legislative task force, which was a savings to the environment. Um, let's see what what brought me to this. Well, I've I have I'm passionate about my career and uh, my profession. I'm passionate about um, everything that was involved in this, I guess. And, and it was a really incredible learning experience for me and a really wonderful thing to be a part of. I'm, I'm really, really glad I did it despite how exhausting it was. Really good to use different parts of my brain. Um, last spring when the, the first and second uh, suggestions came out, I was five years and two months from my retirement age. So you might imagine that that five year piece and the potential of working another 10 years really was a trigger for me. Uh, so if I hadn't been motivated without that, I certainly was by that. And I just started learning a lot and running a lot of numbers. I'm kind of a mathematician in my own space. And um, so I ran a lot of Excel spreadsheets and looked at what outcomes would be for my own pension in different scenarios and um, started organizing locally where I had been union vice, where, where I was at the time actually union vice president um, and just started basically being an educator for my colleagues more than an organizer at first. You know, I really was helping people understand um, what the changes would mean for them and that sort of thing. And um, started working at the state level with Vermont NEA to uh, get, get, you know, do some communications around the changes that were being proposed. And um, then uh, when they the NEA was looking for people to continue to serve, I considered it. I was feeling really exhausted at the end of the school year and um, uh, decided to push through that exhaustion. And like I said, I'm just really glad that I did. It was a pretty amazing experience to work with 13 different people coming from really different perspectives and to be able to hear those different perspectives and really come to understand the problem more fully and be able to then turn around and communicate 
that sort of broader understanding of the problem to my colleagues too, who um, might have been thinking as I was originally more simplistically about underfunding and challenges in Wall Street, but then to also start talking to people about demographic changes and overall needs of the state and all the things that we heard from other members of the task force. Um, yeah, and so I guess I, I'm not sure what else I would say, except that I think that the agreement we came to is one that is uh, something I can really stand behind and really encourage my colleagues to stand behind. And honestly, I think that we've done a lot of good work in that regard in Vermont NEA, and um, it, it feels like people are understanding this agreement and are, are feeling willing and um, I'm not going to quite say eager, but willing to pay the additional contributions to help strengthen the fund for the future um, and to take the offset COLA as well. So I really appreciate the cooperation and listening in the other members of the task force. And I feel good about what I was able to offer as well. Can't get better than that. <laughs> in, Thank in you. Life experience. So we'll go to Andrew, and then if anybody has any questions, um, we did that before. If anybody has any questions for you, um, you can answer them if you want. If you don't want to, you don't have to. So, Andrew. Great. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrew Emmerich. I'm a kindergarten teacher at Brookside Primary School in Waterbury. It's my 11th year teaching. Uh, similar to Molly, I got involved last spring when I was hearing about the proposals from um, Treasurer Pierce and then also the proposals that came out of the House. I began by testifying in the public hearings last year. Um, you know, really, I wanted to be a voice for my fellow educators, especially some people who are new to education, um, getting into a, a field that's really challenging where they're still trying to get their footing um, and they were just exhausted. And I had some extra mental capacity to look at the pension issues more carefully and kind of similar to Molly, help educate them on those pieces and also be a voice for those people. Um, as we move forward, Vermont NEA put together their task force, and I was very interested in joining that, knowing that there would be a, a large representation of educators from across the state, and I thought it would be important to be on there as well. So I, I really thought this was a, uh, a great process to go through. It was long, and we had lots of challenging discussions throughout that weren't always easy, um, but I appreciated the thoughtfulness and respect that everybody brought forth to each meeting. Uh, our recommendations that we ended up presenting on Monday, I was pleased to see those go through with unanimous support by all 12 voting members of the task force. Um, it's a big commitment that the state is making to shore up our pension system. And I heard um, uh, Representative Kitchell speaking about the importance of shoring up the OPED by moving to a pre-funding structure instead of PAYGO. And I think that's also a crucial aspect of this. So that five, 10 years down the road, we're not back at the table having to address that um, OPEB piece for healthcare retirement benefits. I am, I'm a big supporter of everything that we put out there. It's not gonna be easy for all of our colleagues. Um, you know, there are educators, there are many of us who are living paycheck to paycheck and then having to contribute even a little bit more will be challenging for them. So I was glad to see that we could have that progressive structure in our contribution rates and also the gradual phase in over three years if we were to have just bumped this up in one year, that would have been a really big hit that would not have given anybody a chance to prepare for that financially. So I was pleased to see that we could work on that as well. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to continuing this work. I know our recommendations are just kind of one end point continuing on to the next phase. So I was glad to have the opportunity when um, Senator White invited us to join today to come and speak to you all and I'm happy to answer any questions. I know that Chris is here also, and he's fantastic with all the extra details and numbers and was essential to this process. Yes, Chris became um, a, an honorary member. He was with us every step of the way. <laughs> it so, was certainly um, an honor, Madam Chair. Huh? It was certainly an honor, Madam Chair. <laughs> so does anybody have any questions um, for, um, Either Andrew or Molly? No? Thank you so much. And you're welcome to stay with us as long as you want. I know Eric has hung around um, and you are welcome to stay with us. Um, if you, um, 
I will remind you that we don't use um, chat. I saw Molly just sent me a chat, but <laughs> that's okay because I didn't remind us earlier. I usually do. Allison, I saw you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, we we asked some questions uh, of your colleagues earlier. So, uh, but I guess I'd like to ask each of you how you're involved in the educational rollout uh, to your members of of this because we heard about the face, you know, we heard of, uh, both from Kate and um, from Leona and uh, and Eric about their engagement in helping educate the members. And uh, it sounds like, Molly, you're continuing to be involved. I just would like to ask you both how, how that's going and how you're involved. Yeah, sure. So um, Vermont NEA has a, a task force that includes uh, actually, Andrew, can you take it first? I got to turn off my walkie-talkie, or it's going to interrupt us the whole time. Yeah, and yeah, I'm I'm we, happy to. We heard a bit about that. We heard about the the group that's been working. Yeah, that that's been one kind of instrumental part uh, throughout this process, and I know the the task force will continue. Um, Molly, Kate, and I will continue to inform them and help them to understand all the details from Molly, Kate, and I being at the table from nine to four every time in session. I think we've I've really got a good grasp on this. Um, and our colleagues who have been teaching during those days haven't been able to see every single moment that we have. So we're continuing to help educate them so that they can go out and speak to their members as well. We'll be having a pension town hall for our Vermont NEA membership on the, I believe it's Monday the 24th, um, to continue to help roll that information piece out there. In addition to serving on the task force, the internal task force at Vermont EA, I'm also a member of the Vermont NEA Board of Directors. So I've been in communication with the Board of Directors, which really controls the operations of the Vermont NEA and is composed of educators from across the state. So I've been helping to um, present them with information that then they're also taking back to their membership and presenting. So there's really lots of different people that are out there getting this information and continuing to spread it to membership. Um, as far as the social media piece, I'm not a big fan personally of engaging on social media with comments. Um, I feel like often it's the vocal minority that posts their thoughts on there and it's not a representative representation of the, um, the whole community that we represent. So I, I will continue to not only work with my NA board of directors and the internal task force, but also my local association, um, which is the Hartwood Unified Edu Education Association. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I work on the, yeah, I work on the local, um, the, the Vermont NEA at the local level too. So I'm taking the, uh, the information from the state to the local uh, in Wyndham Southeast. And then one of the things that I've been doing as well is uh, connecting with a colleague each in Wyndham Northeast. And I, it's not called Wyndham Central anymore. Is it called the River? I, I, it's the West River yeah. Valley. Oh, they it's changed something. their name. Yeah, and so I've been connecting with them because they haven't had members on the state task force, and it really is quite amazing, like how hard it is to get that information out. I, we had a staff meeting at my school, and of course I'm a rep, and everyone knows that. And Wednesday afternoon we had a staff meeting, and I said, referred to something. It was it was two things that were quite sad news, and I said at the end something like, well, there was an agreement on the pension, and and even people in my own school were like, wait, what, really? And I was like, okay, yeah, let's talk on the hall out here. <laughs> you know, so uh, it does really take that pounding the pavement, I think. And that's what we're going to be doing, as Andrew was describing. I, I do engage a little bit on Facebook. What what I do on, on the Facebook group is that I usually post information that's been put out by NEA or, um, or in, you know, something that I've put out in my district, if it's with my district. I also called two people directly the other day that I saw engaging in Facebook that I that are in my district and who I know and I said hey uh, let's talk because you're on on Facebook talking about it so let's talk about what's what's real and um, had great conversations and that was really grounding so I, I continue to I do continue I do plan to continue to do that because I think sometimes people just get in a role and and need a little like hey let's let's ground ourselves here yeah wow that, 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 how, how wonderful. I wish we had that nationally on every issue. I'm not volunteering. 
And uh, we will con- we will continue to educate the other 175 of our con- our colleagues who were not on the task force because we have some educating to do also. Yeah, which we've begun, but it's a it'll be an ongoing process. <laughs> so yeah, Molly. Well, and I just wanted to say if there are ways that you can call on us to help with that as well, you know, we can help in educating your colleagues as well in terms Good. of being constituents of them across the state. So please, you know, let us know if there are ways that we can, um, you know, activate members if that we haven't been thinking of ourselves. So that's we're, perfect. That's yes. a big offer because I know at, at least before the report came out, I'd had a couple teacher groups saying, oh, we want to meet with you. We want to meet with you. And, and it's much better to meet with you actually that if, if, if there are enough of them that make it worth your time to talk to them. Yep. Well, I think that, I think that Molly also offered not just to meet with teacher groups, but to meet, to, to um, meet with, to have their members meet with their own legislators to to work with them so that they are convinced that this is a good a good package that's what i understood you to say molly yeah i was thinking of like legislative breakfasts that have sometimes happened in windham southeast anyway you know yeah. in our area and, yeah. and we, local groups might be able to meet with legislators and teachers could join in those meetings yep Good idea. Thank you. Individual meetings. You're very busy people. (laughs) Thank you. Um, So you're welcome to stay with us. And what we're doing is Chris is walking us through a slide, a a little slideshow here. And it isn't his vacation slideshows, as you can probably imagine. But I did. And we are going to be joined by Beth at three. Um, so I want to figure out how best to to handle this. And I did see that right before um, we went to Andrew and um, Molly, that Eric had his hand up. So Eric, did you still have a question? If he's uh, still Madam, there. Madam Chair, no, oh. my, my, hand, my hand was up in air. I apologize. Oh. Okay, no, 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 that's just fine. I just wanted to make sure. So, Chris? Well, M- Madam Chair, in the interest of time, I've got about four slides that sum up the teacher uh, proposal. Perhaps we can run through those and then turn it yep. over to the treasurer when she joins. Okay, perfect. Cool. All right. Hopefully, you all can see that slide. So, there's a lot less to explain with the teacher. Uh, Uh, recommendations because there's fewer employee groups uh, to to make differentiations around. But you'll see that a lot of the recommendations hit on similar themes to what what you saw for the state employees. So again, no changes to currently retired or or terminated vested members. Phased in higher employee contribution rates in a progressive manner. Uh, Relatively modest changes to the COLA benefit. The one-time payment here is 125 million. So back to to Senator Polina's uh, question earlier and and building off of what Senator Kitchell mentioned earlier, um, this 125 comprises of the other 75 million half of the 150 that you all reserved in FY21, plus an additional 50 million that is is proposed to be reserved in FY22. So it's 150 from last year plus 50 from this year gets you to the 200 total of one-time money. And that 200 total is then split 75, 125. Um, Exact same construct around the ADAC plus commitment and pre-funding OPEB, but in a slightly different way. So the, the state employee OPEB costs are paid by all the funds of state government in proportion to their share of the active payroll. Um, the, the proposal um, uh, that's, that's being recommended here would be to pre-fund the teacher OPEB in the same way we pay the teacher pension costs, where the normal cost of the benefit is paid out of the ED fund and the, the PAYGO cost of, of providing the benefits to today's retirees and amortizing the unfunded liability uh, rests in the general fund. 
And again, the the this was something that came up as Senator Kitchell mentioned at the the tail end of the budget process last year, and, and the rationale behind putting the the normal cost in the Ed Fund is that the normal cost represents a cost of compensating today's workers with a future retirement benefit. So uh, slide 12 here just shows the, uh, real quickly the, the proposed contribution rates. Um, the recommendation involved a uh, marginal structure that looks like income taxes phased in over a three-year period. So um, uh, again, this does not mean that if you are a member that makes $65,000 that you would pay 7.5% on every dollar of your income. This is like an income tax where you have an effective rate that's based on how your income falls within the different brackets. And similar case here where the, the revenue generated from higher employee contributions offsets the normal cost. So in, in simplistic terms, you can think that every dollar that would be generated from the higher employee contributions is a saved dollar to the Ed Fund. Um, because that, that's where we pay that normal cost out of on the employer side. Slide 13, very similar COLA changes to what you saw on an earlier slide um, in the, in the VSERS recommendations, where the, the current 1% minimum, 5% maximums uh, proposed to be changed to zero and four, and extending the current 12-month minimum of retirement in order to get your first uh, COLA to 24 months. Again, exempting actives who are eligible for normal unreduced retirement as of July 1st from those changes. But one key difference here is that the um, teacher COLA is based on a different formula than the state employee COLA. We, we say the state employees have full COLA. Their, their COLA is calculated on 100% of the CPI. The teachers, it's calculated on a 50% of the CPI basis. So one element of the recommendations is that once the funds reach 80% funded, that, that formula starts to go up in an incremental fashion by 7.5% a year. So you would go from 50% of, of CPI to 57.5% of CPI and so on and so forth. So long as doing so would not cause the fund to drop below 80% funded. If that happens, the, if that's projected to happen, the formula would just stay where it was at the time and then the calculation would be revisited in the next year. But overall, we're looking at at least $4.8 million of ADAC savings and about 35 million in unfunded liability savings. Again, the reason why the numbers don't move quite as far um, with these COLA changes for the, the teachers as they do for the state employees on a previous slide, is because the state employees has a more, have a more generous COLA benefit right now. So when you make changes on the state side, it yields more savings. Slide 12 shows the, the impact of the proposed additional employer contributions. You can see that that $125 million total, if, if you pay that in FY22, you'd see some savings beginning in FY24 of about $12.2 million, and those savings recur in, in future years, and that immediate savings of $125 million on the unfunded liability. Same construct here where that plus payment would uh, fully ramp up by FY26 at $15 million and stay in place till 90% funded. And again, that year-end general fund construct would be, would be reconfigured consistent with what you saw on a previous slide for the state employees. The OPEB proposal um, is a little different, um, but, but again, the, the same theme is, uh, the recommendation is that you fund this according to an ADAC strategy, the way you do with the pensions. But with this proposal, um, the recommendation calls for putting $13.3 million from the Ed Fund that's currently reserved from the budget negotiations last year, move that over to the Teacher OPEB Trust to begin pre-funding. So in order to help hedge against short-term volatility in investment performance or claims experience and costs, it's a good idea to start with a little chunk of money and then begin your pre-funding. The state employees got that chunk of money in the year-end construct last year. Here, we need the, the recommendation calls for using 13.3 million of the currently reserved 14 million in the Ed Fund to begin the pre-funding. Then moving forward, funding that normal cost out of the Ed Fund. So that starts at 15.1 million in FY23 and will increase with payroll uh, as you go beyond that. And then apply the current pay go amounts 
out of the general fund to pre-fund OPEP. So that way we're, we're sort of mirroring the construct that we have in place for the pension systems. Slide 16, again, similar chart that just shows you the relative impact of the different savings. And these are very preliminary numbers pending actuarial review and, and some timing constraints. But the really exciting thing in this box is what you see on the right here, where uh, you see that 34.9 million of unfunded liability savings from those pension uh, recommendations, another $125 million of savings from that one-time payment uh, recommended to be made by the state. Pre-funding OPEB, again, huge, huge, huge impact, $837 million reduction in that unfunded liability. So you get to just under a billion of unfunded liability impact from this proposal. You add that to the just over 1 billion for the, the state employees, and you're at a little over $2 billion total. The final chart here on slide 17, just tries to sum impact up by fund um, for both charts, again, for both systems. Again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because the numbers are so preliminary at this stage, but I just wanted to give you a sense of how things uh, are likely to shake out um, uh, in terms of the impact to the different funds. And again, we need the actuaries to do some number crunching to, to confirm exactly what year we'll see which savings. But based on the, these numbers are based on the projections and the, the preliminary estimates that the task force has received up to this point. And with that, that is the, the, the quick and dirty overview of the, the summary of the recommendations and some dollars, uh, dollar estimates attached to it. And uh, I know the treasurer has joined us and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have uh, or, or sit tight in the background. So yeah, Senator Polina. Yeah, this, I appreciate this. This is a lot to digest, believe me. <laughs> believe me, I have a question. It may be simple, may not be, but we're talking about pre-funding the healthcare. I understand that the money is going to come out of the education fund. Does that just mean it's more money out of the education fund? There's no money going into the education fund directly to do that, right? It's just there, an there added is. expense. That's a great question. Some of that higher cost would be offset by the pension savings. So okay. higher higher teacher uh, pension contributions offset the the normal cost to the pension to the ed fund. Um, some of the changes to the COLA that would reduce the normal cost also result in some savings to the ed fund. So things do not perfectly counter each other out, but it's down to within like single digit millions of, uh, of cost. So we're essentially making, we're, we're doing cost savings, which is gonna allow us to add to funding for the healthcare. That, that's basically it. Yeah, we're, we're, we're yeah. basically trying to, to find savings in one bucket to offset the, the fiscal impact of the higher of the right. higher costs for the OPEB and for the plus payments. Because I could just I I see could see I could see people being sensitive about it and saying, well, there's more money coming out of the ed fund, you know, where's it how are we paying for this? That mm -hmm. so I like your explanation. It makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, and, and one important thing that, that Senator Kitchell mentioned and, and and I would reiterate is you know the, the normal cost is a cost of compensating today's teachers. This is not a cost that represents any sort of bad decision in the past or or uh, an investment loss in the past, the normal cost is what you should be setting aside every year over the course of an active member's employment to make sure that you've got enough money to fund their retirement benefits when they retire. And, and if I can just say this, that this package um, as it what has been presented has the, um, it has the blessing of the um, chair of House Ways and Means, who is a fierce protector of the education fund. So I just wanted to throw that out. Yeah. I also wanted to respond a little bit to, um, and then we'll go to Beth, um, from Senator uh, Clark, Senator Collimore's question about when you said $2 billion, and he said, yeah. And it didn't ever Dirksen once say a billion here, a billion there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money. Yeah. I've heard uh, okay. Tom Cavett say a trillion here, a trillion there, given the way uh, Washington has been doling out money lately. <laughs> I prefer Everett Dirksen's. <laughs> No, and I love Rockefeller's early one in Standard Oil in the in 1920s or something. I was like, what's a million dollars? Well, probably the equivalent now of a trillion. Could we take okay. a five minute break before um, the state treasurer? Yes, yes we, I, I was going to suggest.
even I was going to suggest that. Oh, Senator no, Collins. I can't believe it. <laughs> so okay. Beth, does that meet with your, is that okay with you if we take a five minute break? She said, right. absolutely. I couldn't oh, okay. hear her, but I could read her lips. Okay, thank you. And everybody, uh, so we're going off you.